Share the screen. And stuff like that. Okay, so again, time-wise, we're fine. Um, so 5.3, I'm just introducing 5.3. So if I'm going strictly by the schedule, I'm behind, but I'm not really behind. I got all these extra days here, so we have plenty of time to finish what we need to. Okay, so I'll lecture very little on 5.3. I was just gonna do the first two problems and then stop and give you the quiz, and that's about it. Okay, so in case everybody doesn't know, uh, tomorrow and Friday, holidays, uh, no school. Not just my class, no classes at all. Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving. Quizzes again due Monday. You got plenty of time. You got what today, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even maybe some Monday to the quiz. Okay, again, we're aiming for the last regular test to be Thursday, December 10th. Friday review for the final, and then final exam is on Wednesday, the 16th. Even during finals week, I will have limited office hours when I know what they are. I'll let you know. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. I was gonna do um, problems two and three, just two and three. I guess I'll start checking it out. Okay, I'll save seven to 41 from when we come back from Thanksgiving. And then that's about it. Okay, so we have this area function, this weird area function as part of the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Uh, 5.3, page 392. So here's our function. G of X is the integral from A to X. And we're talking about an exact value now. So A is fixed, that's a constant, but X moves. So imagine fixing A and X moves left and right. So as you change the value of X, you change the amount of area, right? And again, it could be a signed area, S-I-G-N-E-D. It could be positive, it could be negative. So as X moves around, I get a different area associated with the graph. It's technically a different integral. So that's what's going on. It's this weird function. It is a function of X. It's given in terms of an integral. So the key thing for the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one is that constant on the bottom, variable on the top. Okay. So for FTC part one, okay, we're gonna use this more when we come back from the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So g of x is defined as the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Okay. Key thing is that constant on the bottom, variable on the top. Okay. So what happens if it's reversed? I'll show you. What happens if there are two variable expressions? I'll show you. Okay. But basically the idea is that g prime of x is f of x. So if you want the derivative of this function, all you do is just put that x right there and you get f of x. Okay. And I'll show you that next uh, week. Okay, so constant here, variable there. Piggybacking off of that though, are these concepts. And again, we, we won't really get into it until next time, but I'm gonna use these properties back on page 385. The integral from B to A is the opposite of the integral from A to B. Okay, so that's one way you can deal with it. Okay. So for FTC1, fundamental theorem of calculus part one, it's supposed to be constant here, variable on the top. If it's flipped, you can just flip it and put a minus sign. Right, so that's one way to do it. Okay. And of course we know this, integral from A to A is always zero. The other concept we'll use is this one I showed you yesterday on page 387. The integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B is equal to the integral from A to B, right? So we talk about area, right? Area under the curve from A to C plus area under the curve from C to B. Well, it's just as if we went straight from A to B in the first place. Okay, so we'll use those in conjunction with each other. But right now, the two homework problems two and three are being based off of this weird area function. Yeah, g of x is the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Okay, so we're going to get started with those. 
I was just going to do only those two. Okay, so in problems two and three, five point three, problem two and three to give you a picture. So let's take a look at the pictures, okay? You might switch it yellow on me sometimes. That's too many yellows. Okay, so number two. G of X is the integral from zero to X. So we're starting at zero, and you're going to a variable quantity X. X can move around, so you have a different value for the integral. Okay, so evaluate G of X for X equals zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Estimate G of seven. Okay? <clears throat> right, so if I plug in zero, you're talking about the integral from zero to zero. Well, that's zero, right? And I can just kind of show you both of these at the same time. So I'm making a little table, x versus g of x, zero, zero, okay? I can't show you at the same time because otherwise the book's about to fall off of me. No, I don't have enough hands, but okay, g of one, so the integral from zero to one, that's half a unit. So 0 0.5. Okay. G of 2. Now, the G of 2 is here. So I've got half a unit above, half a unit below. The net result is 0. Okay. And we keep going. G of 3. 1, 2, 3. Okay, so half a unit above, half a unit below. They cancel out. Right. For between 2 and 2, I have another half a unit below. So the net total is negative 0 0.5 for the integral from 0 to 3. <clears throat> 4, I got 0. So by the time I reach back up to 4, I got another half a unit above. <clears throat> okay, so plus a half, minus a half, minus a half, plus a half. So the total from 0 to 4 is 0. Okay. We're taking the region bounded by the graph and the x-axis. Always look at the graph and the x-axis. Anything below the x-axis counts as a negative. Everything above counts as a positive. Okay, now we got the rest is positive stuff. Okay, so it's zero from there to there. Okay, so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, now we want to go to five. Okay, so that's one and a half. So 1.5. Okay, I already know from zero to four the net total is zero. So I don't have to you know, reinvent the wheel, so to speak, go all the way back. I know that's another one, and that's a 0.5. So 1.5. How about integral from 0 to 6? So for 6, I get another 1, 2, and a half. So I add another 1 and a half to what I had at 5, so that gives me 4. So 6 gives me 4. <clears throat> okay, part B. So I'm done with A, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have 0, 0 0.5, 0, negative 0 0.5, 0, 1.5, and 4. Part B, estimate G of 7. And you can see why it says estimate. I can get the exact value when I have straight line segments. Okay, once I get a curve, I can only make a guess. Okay, so here's my guess. If I drew a straight line from there to there, I'd have a triangle, which is 1.5, right? Area is one half base times height. The height is three. That's one, so 1 1.5. Or another way to think of it is you can tell this is one, two, three squares, right? One, two, three squares. If I go in a straight line from there to there, that's going to cut it in half, so that'd be 1.5. Okay. Now, the way it's curving, it's a little bit more than 1.5, so I guess it was an extra two. So that's the reason why I put seven, six is my estimate. Okay, so that curved region right there, I'm going to guess it's two. Again, if I go in a straight line from there to there, it's 1.5. I'm getting a little bit more than that, so I'm going to call it 2. So 7, 6. Okay. All right, where does G have a maximum value? Where does it have a minimum value? <clears throat> so I'll just take a look. Maximum occurs at x equals 7, I got 6. Minimum occurs at x equals 3 at negative 0 0.5. Okay, so max as an ordered pair is 7, 6. Minimum as an ordered pair is 3, negative 0.5. Okay, so the minimum 
means you've got the most amount of area below the x-axis. That happens right there at three, right? Because right here, you've got positive a half, negative a half, negative a half. So that's going to be the minimum value. It's the most negative. Then after that, you stay above the x-axis. So it makes sense that the maximum would occur at the highest value, which is seven. Okay, then D, sketch a rough graph of G. Well, all I did was take these points and plot them, where it's X versus G of X, right? So this is the graph of X and this is G of X. So I just plotted 0, 0, 1, 0 0.5, 2, 0, all the way down the line. You can do that as well as I can. And there it is. And you can see the minimum occurs at X equals three. I'm down half a unit. And the highest is at seven comma six way over here. Okay. So I can't show you both at the same time, but I plotted, you know, zero, zero, one comma, 0 0.5, two comma, zero, three comma, negative 0 0.5 and so on, all the way up to seven, six. And that's what the graph looks like. So there we go. Okay, that's it for two. And then number three, and then after three, I'm finished. Then I'll give you the quiz. Same game. Three, there's no curves. Everything is a straight line. So we should be able to get the exact answer because it looks like I've just got a bunch of rectangles and squares and triangles. I know how to find all those areas, right? Okay, so G of X is defined as the integral from zero to X. Again, notice constant in the bottom, variable on the top. Okay, f of t dt, where f is the function whose graph is. Okay, so evaluate all of these. I decided to do all of them. I went 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I'll answer all of these and more. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so what's g of 0? What's the integral from 0 to 0? Zero? 0. So 0, 0. Okay. 1. I pick up one, two squared. So one comma two. Two, okay, between one and two, only between one and two. I pick up one, two, and this represents one more because it's one half base times height, right? So I net it three more. One, two, and this triangle is another one. Or another way you can think of it is if I take this rectangle, that's clearly two, right? The one I'm tracing out is two, that cuts it in half, so that's one. So I pick up an extra one, two, three. So I add three more from what I used to have, which was two, so now I'm at five. So two, five. The net area under the curve from zero to two is five units. That's what we're saying. Okay, now between two and three, how much extra do I pick up? Okay, I got another tri triangle. Okay, it's one half base times height. Or let me use this strategy again. But point out these four squares: one, two, three, four squares. Okay, I'll trace it out. That's clearly four, right? That's four. That line cuts it in half, which means it's an extra two. Okay, so from two to three, I pick up an extra two, which now means I have three comma seven. That's what I have so far. And then after that, I start going negative, so I'm going to be subtracting. Right? So between three and four, I subtract half a square. So I take off a half from seven to 6.5. And then between four and five, between four and five, I lose another 1.5. Right? There's one square, and that's half a square. So from four to five, I drop another 1.5, which means I'm not down to five. And evidently from five to six, I lose two. Let's take a look. From five to six, do I lose two? Yes, I do. One here and one here. Below the x-axis, so I drop two. down to three. I am between six and seven, I drop another one. Between six and seven, six and seven, yes. The area of that triangle is one. 
you can either say one half base times height, or you can see that this is clearly two, right? That's two, that cuts it in half, so I drop another one. So there we go. Okay, B, on what interval is G increasing? When is the function increasing? Well, between zero and three, and then it starts decreasing. Right? So where on what interval is G increasing? Part B, the open interval from zero to three. So that answers the question. On what interval is G increasing? Part B, zero to three. <clears throat> How does that show up in the picture? That's where the graph is positive, right? So anywhere from zero to three, as I pick up more and more area, it's a positive quantity. And then after that, the graph drops below the x-axis, so I'll be losing, so it starts decreasing, right? C, where does G have a maximum value? Well, at three comma seven. Three, Seven. And one thing to watch out for, I hope you catch this. These look like the same notation, but this is an interval. This is a point, x comma y. The context is usually clear. This is the open interval from zero to three, means start at zero, but don't count zero. Go up to three, but don't count three, but you count 2.99999999. Okay, this is an interval. This, even though it has the same notation, it's a left paren, number, comma, number, Paren, this is a point, an ordered pair, three comma seven. So where does G have a maximum value? Three comma seven, okay, and that makes sense because up until three, I'm getting a positive quantity for the area, and then after that, it's all negative. Okay, and then D, sketch a rough graph of G. Again, all I did was take all of these points, sorry, I can't show you both at the same time, but I plot at zero, zero, then I plotted one, two. And then I plotted two, five, and so on. Just plot them all, and there's the graph. So that's all. So if I plot this new graph, sort of an area function, you can see, oh yeah, that's the maximum, three comma seven. And then after that, it starts to go down. Okay. So that was two and three. And that was all I was going to do today, folks. Okay, so, show you two and three. Then we'll start doing um, next Monday. Where are we? Yeah, start doing the 7 to 41 stuff. Okay, we'll be doing fundamental theorem of calculus part one. How do you find the derivatives of functions given as integrals? Okay, so let me just show you where we're headed. Like seven. Find the derivatives of these functions. Okay. If you go straight by the fundamental theorem of calculus and there's no tricks or surprises, okay, constant variable, all you do is put the x right there. The answer is going to be square root of x plus x cubed. Okay. It does get tricky though if they reverse it, variable and constant. Okay. And even trickier if they have constant and a constant, uh, sorry, a variable and a variable. And that doesn't show up until the problems at the end. Um, yeah, like 59. See, so what do I do if I have a variable and a variable? Okay, they actually give you a hint. So if you want to know, learn ahead of time, you can look at what they have there. Same thing for 61, same thing for 63, if you have a variable and a variable right there. Okay. But other than that, that was all I was going to do today. Okay, so let me check the chat and see if anybody has anything. And if not, I'll just take to the quiz. Okay, so chat, nothing there. Anybody have any questions? Otherwise, we'll go straight to the quiz, and then that'll be it until next Monday. All right, so quiz time. So as usual, get your cell phones and cameras ready, and then I'll put you in your breakout rooms, and it's due Monday, and everybody have a nice Thanksgiving. No class on Thursday, no class Friday. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Estimate the area under the curve of y equals natural log of x from x equals 1 to x equals 9 by dividing the intervals into four sub-intervals and then computing L4, R4, and M4, left endpoints, right endpoints, and midpoints. Okay, the calculation should, should not be that bad. 
Okay. After all, how far is it from one to nine? Right? From one to nine is eight. They tell me to chop it up into four subintervals. So that's a nice number. And it's very convenient to find the midpoints also. Okay. L4, R4, and M4. Okay, so I will assume everybody has it right now. Worst comes to worst, it's on the video. Okay, so you can watch the video. I'm still recording right now and go from there. Okay, due next Monday, but if you want to finish earlier, that, that's fine. And everybody have a nice Thanksgiving. Okay, so get started. Let me set up your uh, breakout rooms that you'll be going to. And